find a visitation I made a couple of years ago to another parish in the diocese where, as part of my visit there, I was asked to bless a brand new parking lot. Ah, uh, the glamorous life of a bishop. As part of our prayer, we invited the young people, or the young at heart, to help bless the new lot with holy water. There were several large buckets standing on the porch, looking out onto that parking lot, several large buckets of water for this purpose. There were evergreen branches neatly laid out, and, <coughs> wait for it, there were water cannons. For the young people, we figured that that would help teenagers get into the act, right? And so I prayed, said the prayer of blessing. We started singing, and to the sound of our singing, we set off in all directions to douse the asphalt for Christ. Exuberance soon took over, as you might have guessed, and by the end of the procession, well, let's just say there is such a thing as a holy water fight. <laughs> Not just the parking lot got blessed, I got soaked. Water. Water is a central sign for Christians. Water is central to what it is to be human, I think. It's the source and sustainer of life and the great new, the great sign of our new life in Christ. Water is all of those things and water can also wreak havoc. Out in the corn growing parts of the diocese, I heard a farmer, the cow, say that once the drought can hurt you, but flooding will kill you, he said. If there's too much water, farmers can't even get into the fields. In this climate changing world of ours, life threatening floods take center stage over and over again. Warming oceans contribute to all kinds of new dangers. When I lived in Seattle, when I lived in Seattle, I discovered the first winter that it was all too clear that torrential rains and mudslides could threaten entire communities. In South Sudan, our companion diocese, I have seen crops, the sorghum crops, withering on the banks of the Nile for the lack of basic means of getting water from the river into the fields. I saw in the paper this morning that in Rogers Park, just north of the city of Chicago, houses are now being threatened by Lake Michigan and its 20-foot waves last night. Now water is both a sign of hope and life and also an agent of destruction sometimes. Today, today this commemoration of the Feast of the Baptism of Jesus, we're still standing in the light of the great Feast of the Epiphany. Epiphany is a day with more ancient and venerable roots than Christmas itself. It's the original liturgical celebration of the coming of Christ among us. And sure, the stars of the show are those magi, wise ones from the east, quite possibly from Persia, present-day Iran, if you please. Some of the best music of the season, we three kings of Orient are, I don't know about you, it's my favorite. Maybe too many Christmas pageants or something, I don't know. But the Magi and their ominous gifts are only one part of the way that Christians have kept the Feast of the Epiphany. The word Epiphany in Greek means revelation, uncovering, manifestation. This season of Epiphany has been a time to celebrate the revealing of the meaning of Christ. And we do that with various scriptural commemorations, the season of Epiphany is a time to celebrate the revealing of the meaning of Jesus. The Magi saw that star and came with their strange gifts to signify the mystery of just who this unlikely baby really was. You know, they were not giving candy canes to Jesus and his mother when they arrived. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's easy to pass by those things, seeing them all too often at the crash, right? But gold? Gold for king. But a king lying in a manger, a king unlike any other king the world might know, a king, a baby king who provoked Herod into some murderous outrage. Incense, fog up the soothsaying. These magi may well have been astrologers. 
those who were telling fortunes, that kind of thing, and myrrh, myrrh, associated with preparation of a body for burial. You know, they're ominous gifts about the meaning of Jesus. Today, of course, we remember particularly the baptism of Jesus when he came up out of the water and the voice declared him to be the one in whom God is well pleased. From early, early times, this was one of the church's privileged seasons to make new Christians. Days to celebrate the baptismal washing and anointing and feeding of newborn sisters and brothers in Christ. Days to celebrate the presence of the dying and rising Jesus in them, in the newly baptized, right in front of us. The revealing of Jesus is what all of this is for. The revelation of the one who came to be God with us is the whole point of the church and its life. It's really the only excuse for us. And that revealing, that revealing of Jesus, I think is as troubling to the world, and perhaps to us, as it was to Jerusalem in those first times, to Herod, its psychotic king, and its gossip-filled streets. The presence of Jesus Christ is always troubling to those who wield the world's power to coerce and threaten and judge and exclude. I get very nervous when Jesus is turned into simply a comforting blessing of any political status quo. The reign of God, if we take it seriously, the reign of God upends all our assumptions about the kind of power on display on the geopolitical stages of the world. I like these epiphany days. I like them, and I like their images. I like them much more than Christmas. I have to tell you, I like them because they're more truthful than Christmas has become. The sugar plum fairy has flown the coop. And the sentimentality attached to all of that, largely, has been packed away for another year with all those ornaments, and in their place, stand something much more truthful in the place of all that sentimentality that is the real war on Christmas, if you ask me. It's not even commercialism. I'm not at the mall. That's fine. I don't care. It's a big economic engine. It's the sentimentality I worry about. We can't have only the sweetness of Christmas. And in the place of that sweetness today stands our font. There's water. That ambiguous sign. Our Hebrew foreparents lived and moved and came into being as a people in and near the water, at the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea, and on the shores of the Mediterranean, but they never became great seafarers. The sea is a place of strangeness for the Jews. There are monsters out there, according to the psalm. It's the symbol of life, water. The people of Israel were brought through the parted waves to safety on the other side. But water is also an agent of death. Noah and his family were the only ones saved from the flood. Pharaoh and his chariots did not escape. It was over the watery chaos of non-being that the Holy Spirit first hovered and brought all things to birth. So it's not accidental. It is not accidental that to be grafted onto the story of God's people, to become a member of the body of Christ, to be a Christian means passing through water. It's both a sign of hope and an agent of destruction. If we are to be united with Christ, truly one with and in him, then we should not be surprised to encounter what he did. And we won't. The trouble the heartache, the terrors, and tidal waves of this life didn't spare Jesus. And I've got something to tell you this morning. That's good news. It's good news that Jesus was not spared the human condition. It's good news beyond imagining because Jesus has entered this world. This world, not some slicked up, romanticized, religious fantasy one. This one, with its dangers and terrors and out-of-control kings and all the rest. And what is revealed in Jesus Christ is not a solution or a formula or an explanation for understanding the pain and horror of this world. What is revealed is simply and stunningly what Jesus always reveals. 
power of God made plain in us. In us. A favorite author of mine says this, the word became flesh and we've been trying to turn that flesh back into words ever since. Jesus is God's word made flesh. This is the difference between faith, I believe, and religion. Religion can be mighty dangerous. Watch the news. Religion, when we think we have reduced God into a neat and tidy formula, however that neat and tidy formula reads. The power of the gospel is not that Jesus became a series of clever words. The power of the gospel is that God in Jesus entered us. Entered the fullness of humanity. <clears throat> at every baptism, at every baptism, the heavens are torn apart, the Spirit descends, and there is a voice declaring the incomprehensible truth to you and to me. This, you are my cherished daughter, you are my much-loved son, and I am well pleased. You and I are members of the dying and rising body of Christ. And this morning, as we renew the solemn vows of our baptism, we promise, every time we celebrate baptism, every time there's a confirmation, we celebrate and promise to make real in our lives what God has already declared to be true. Step by step, day by day, we promise to become God's Word made flesh. You and I have died in the water of the font and been reborn to another kind of life, a way of living for others. Listen to these promises we'll be making again this morning. Just a minute. We promise to live for others, even at the cost of our own safety and comfort, just like Jesus. Like the Lord we follow. We hold out our hands right here this morning, every Sunday. We hold out our hands, we present ourselves to become what God has already declared us to be. Broken bread. Poured out wine. Food. Ourselves. Food. For the hungers of this world. 